we are obviously going to be dealing with the whole enterprise of science. Uh, now, obviously, with a topic like this, there's just way too much to cover. There's, there's all kinds of issues in cosmology and biology and every other field within the scientific enterprise. It's just too vast to try to you know, get to, to the more fundamental questions in every one of those disciplines. So what we are going to try to do is just try to try to do like a flyover the whole issue as far as Christianity and science are concerned. Try to get a bird's eye view of the whole um, enterprise. And we're gonna our main goal for tonight is to actually attempt to uh, address three issues, three questions, if you will, examining the the myth of the science versus faith conflict. That's going to be one. The other one we're going to look at is where do science and Christianity actually uh, overlap or where are they compatible with each other? And the third one is questions that science cannot answer. Okay. Um, so let's, let's start with uh, the myth of the science versus faith conflict. And the question is, is there an actual conflict between science and faith? Now, we live in such a naturalistic culture today that almost unanimously the answer to this question is going to be yes. Um, yeah, of course. Of course there's a conflict. Science and faith are at completely two different ends of the spectrum. And um, if you hold to one, by definition, you cannot hold to the other or vice versa. Uh, and unfortunately, I think there are some, you know, maybe... There are a lot of Christians, too, who have, who have kind of fallen into that view. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, reality does not reflect this myth. Um, but first, before we get to that, because, you know, as Sean said, you know, God, is, God has basically given us two books, right? One book is sort of the book of nature, the world around us, but he's also given us um, his word. So we'll get to the nature part of it, but we have to start with the word of God, because... That is his primary revelation to us. And so we want to dismantle some uh, straw man fallacies uh, when it comes to the scriptures. You'll remember several weeks ago we did a session on logic. And we covered what are called logical fallacies. Now, one particular fallacy is called the straw man fallacy. right? And the straw man fallacy says that instead of addressing the actual issue, the issue is misrepresented to look trivial or look funny or look, um, you know, untrustworthy, and then it is attacked based on a caricature of that issue. That's the basic definition of a straw man fallacy. And oftentimes you'll find that uh, this is what is done uh, to the Christian faith. So many people in the scientific enterprise, they tend to misrepresent the true nature of faith. Faith is often portrayed as, as a blind leap, um, or as a leap in the dark, or believing in something without evidence. The Bible is often mischaracterized as a bunch of fairy tales. So before we go any further, let's try to address that straw man fallacy first, okay? So one thing you'll hear a lot is the Bible is unscientific. This is often a, a critique. And unscientific implies that it is lacking something, right? So when, whenever you put the prefix un in front of something, it means it is lacking it. He's, he's uh, unruly. It means he doesn't you know, behave himself properly. He's, he's unworthy. He's un, untrustworthy, right? He does, he's lacking uh, you know, the ability to be trusted. And so they say that the Bible is unscientific, and this implies that it is lacking something. The fact of the matter is, though, that actually the Bible is pre-scientific in time and non-scientific in purpose. Do you see the distinction? Okay, the, the culture wants to say that the Bible is unscientific, meaning that it lacks something. But the fact of the matter is the Bible is actually pre-scientific in time and it is non-scientific in purpose. So what does that mean? The prefix non actually implies that it is intentionally left out. It's not missing something. It's not lacking something. Okay? 
And so non implies the intentional exclusion of scientific premises. So what does that mean? What that means is God did not intend his word to be scientific in nature, but rather salvific in nature. Does that make sense? Okay, so a lot of people look at the Bible and they're like, this doesn't make sense. This is, you know, this doesn't, it's not compatible with science and all that. And they, they're thinking of some sort of scientific journal or some, some, some sort of scientific textbook. But the fact of the matter is that was never God's intention. God's intention was not to give you a science book. It was to give you his word that was meant to save you. Okay, its purpose is not to educate humanity, but to save humanity. So, this is what it comes down to. Ultimately, science is concerned with function and mechanism, and God's holy scripture is concerned with purpose and meaning. So, the, the playing field is completely different for science versus the scriptures. And I think it's, it, it does injustice to a proper engagement of the topic if we try to fit everything in one box. Does that make sense? So often, that's why I think this critique of faith, this critique of scriptures is misplaced because we're trying to hold it to a standard that it was never intended to, to meet. We're trying to hold it, we're trying to squeeze uh, faith and theology and all these things into a particular kind of box that was never part of God's plan. It's like trying to, trying to squeeze a square peg into a you know, round hole. It's just not going to work because it's not designed for that. So we must not fall for the mistaken premise that everything in this world requires an answer. This is one of the, this is, this is kind of one of the, the hidden, you know, it's, it's almost like a, like a backhanded, uh, it's like a sleight of hand in the scientific enterprise. And this whole idea that we have an answer for this. We have an answer for this. <laughs> and there's, there's such a, there's such a drive that everything requires an answer, and there are so many things that faith cannot answer, so we have the higher ground. Okay, and first of all, um, I think a lot of people are absolutely fine. They, we, we move about every day in our lives not knowing a lot of things. Okay, now what do I mean by that? So for example, the scientist who, who says, you need rational evidence for everything. You have to have evidence for everything. You have to know with 100% certainty that this is going to be this before you can do something. When he walks, when a scientist is walking somewhere, is he thinking about the, the careful nature with which he should take every step? No, he doesn't. It's almost, it's almost automatic. right? He's just thinking he needs to get here. He, he assumes that the law of gravity is going to work the way it's supposed to. He assumes that the equilibrium in his ears is, you know, is going to keep him straight and help him headed in this direction. He assumes a lot of things. He actually doesn't have, like, he's not seeing evidence for it every time. A lot of you, when you walk out of this class, you're, you have plans to go home and do X, Y, Z. Uh, there's, you are basically holding to a certain premise of faith that you're going to make it home. Based on what? What's your evidence you're going to make it home? I'm not, I'm not trying to be morbid, I'm just saying, you know, anything can happen after you walk out of this place. So, people live every day with a certain amount of faith. We just assume some things, and that's okay. But the scientific enterprise, I think, sometimes uh, puts this sort, of, this sort of false standard where it says that everything requires an answer, and that's not necessarily true. So, there are several issues you know, like, for example, the age of the universe, dinosaurs, or, uh, you know, life on other planets. These are all very interesting questions. These are all very interesting topics. But these are not biblical issues. And maybe that's disappointing to some of you. Um, but the fact of the matter is, as interesting as those things are, it, is, it was not part of God's purpose to educate you on dinosaurs. Does that make sense? Okay? Uh, the, this holy scriptures are designed to save you. They're salvific in nature. They're not scientific in nature. Now, we can still conclude a few things. We can try to speculate a few things. But I think oftentimes uh, we, we divide ourselves on some of these ancillary issues. I've actually seen a lot of Christians um, 
it's unfortunate. Like in, in today's time, you have to use the word unfriend, right? That, I don't even think that lingo existed maybe about 15 years ago. But I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of Christians unfriend other Christians just because they found out that they were old Earth people that they believed that the Earth was a million years old, and they believe these people believe that the Earth is only a few thousand years old. And we assume all kinds of things about their theology. If you believe the earth is a million years old, how you can't be a Christian. Whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. These are all ancillary issues, and we don't need to be divided by this. And I think one of the things that science has done, and I, maybe it's not right to say science has done, I think scientists have done, is they've tried to squeeze everything into a box that has actually polarized, um, polarized the Christian faith itself. When you try to squeeze theology and try to squeeze faith within a scientific box, it just doesn't work. And we're going to address some of these things later when we talk about issues that science actually cannot answer. Okay. So again, keep in mind that uh, it's, it's interesting to talk about the age of the universe. It's interesting to talk about life on other planets and all that. But none of those things are salvific in nature. Your salvation does not hang on what you believe about the so, now that we, we kind of talked about what the Bible is meant to be and what it's not meant to be, let's get back to the science-faith conflict. Science looks for causality. Causality is another word for cause and effect in the universe. And it does this primarily through research. And research involves observations and experiments. Now, my boys are actually doing this in their homeschool. Uh, Alicia is actually walking them through what is the what is a scientific methodology, right? So Caleb, my seven-year-old, is learning about okay, what is a hypothesis? Uh, what is uh, so you have four stages? You have a hypothesis, you have an experiment, then you have observation, and then you have conclusion. So there are four stages to it. And so we we hypothesize something. Okay, so the other day he and I. We did this experiment about, you know, the hypothesis was which leaf is going to burn faster, a green leaf or a dry brown leaf? Okay, the hypothesis was that the brown leaf was going to burn faster. Why? Because it's dry. Then we did the experiment. Then we did the observation. We timed it. We wanted to see, okay, the green leaf actually took three seconds to burn up. The brown leaf took like a second and a half, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. And, and then we came to the conclusion, and our conclusion matched our hypothesis. The brown leaf burned faster. So this is a scientific methodology, right? And that is the, the, the basis on which science operates. They see certain things within the, within the universe. They assume certain things about it. They try to replicate it. And they try to replicate it several times and see if it comes up with consistent uh, conclusions. And then the conclusion actually confirms their hypothesis. So science primarily operates within the parameters of space, time, and matter. Now, science can only comment on the mechanism of a process, but not the meaning behind it. Okay, write that down. That's an important, that's an important distinction. Science can only explain the mechanism of natural processes, but cannot comment on the meaning behind the process. C.S. Lewis said this, right? He said, the laws of motion do not set the billiards balls moving. They merely analyze the motion after something else has already provided it. You see what he's saying? He's saying that science has the ability to, to figure out the, the kinetic energy of a moving billiard ball. It can do that. But it can never, it, it, it cannot try to figure out, it can only analyze the motion only after something else that is outside of the purview of science has already given that ball a push. Okay, that's basically what he's saying. So, let's get a little bit more technical here. We're going to go a little bit deeper, so stay with me. It's important here to make a distinction between agency and mechanism. So, let's define it. Agency is the office or the function of an agent. Mechanism is the organized process by which something takes place. All right? Agency is the officer function of an agent. Mechanism is the organized process by which something takes place. 
Now keep in mind, we already said that science can only explain the mechanism of a process, but it is not in a position to analyze anything else. So let me give you an example to help you understand that. In the 1800s, uh, a German businessman by the name of Carl Benz was the first one to create the, the first automobile that used an internal combustion engine that used fuel to run. Then Henry Ford, of course, the American uh, businessman in the 1900s, was the first person to mass produce automobiles on an assembly line to make them commercially available to the public. Obviously, there's a, a little picture of an internal combustion engine. It's not really that colorful if you actually look under the hood. Uh, this is just an image I got off from, from online, but uh, just so you can actually see the pistons and all those things. But that's, that's a basic internal combustion engine. You have two-stroke engines, four-stroke engines, uh, and all those kinds of uh, variations. And uh, let me see if I if this actually works. Uh, it would be nice if it actually works. There you go. It actually works. Yeah, so it's kind of how it works. That's, that's the intake valve right there, and that's how you know, the, the mixture comes in, and the spark plug ignites it, and then pushes the piston down, and that pushes the exhaust out in the other uh, direction. So we know how it works. It's basically a heat engine where fuel is ignited with an oxidizer, and inside the combustion chamber, uh, there's, there's an explosion, like a mini explosion, and that, that drives the piston. What does this have to do with anything? Scientists claim that we understand how processes work. We understand the science behind it. We know what is causing something. Remember we said that science is very interested in causality, right? So science has come to this, uh, this, this conclusion that we now understand how all these things work. Therefore, we don't need God as an explanation to understand anything. But here's the deal. This is like saying, we understand how the internal combustion engine works, therefore, we don't need to consider Mr. Carl Benz. Do you see this? Do you see the problem with this? This is like saying, we understand how the internal combustion engine works, so we don't need Mr. Carl Benz anymore. So what's the problem with this? This confuses the categories of agency and mechanism. The concept of the internal combustion engine mechanism came from the agency that was the mind of Carl Benz. So if you remove Carl Benz from the equation, what happens? You lose that, right? Fair enough? See, but this happens all the time. This is actually a foundational, sort of a cornerstone of the scientific enterprise. This, this, mistaken, uh, this mistaken idea that now that we understand how the mechanism works, we don't need an agent to explain it. But the mechanism came from the mind of an agent. If you remove the agent, the mechanism collapses. That's a problem, right? Similarly, the mechanisms or processes that scientists discover in the world around them come from the agency of God's creation. You cannot remove God as the cause of all natural processes any more than you can remove Carl Benz as the cause behind the internal combustion engine. So write this down. We must not confuse the distinction between agency and mechanism. Right? We must not confuse the distinction between agency and mechanism. And this is precisely what the scientific enterprise does. The scientific enterprise puts such an elevation and exaltation on mechanism that they completely want to ignore agency and say that agency, an intelligent agency or a divine agency or a transcendent agency is unnecessary because the mechanism is what matters. You know, uh, just like Sean said, God has revealed himself to us through two sources. He has made himself known through the word, his word, right? In theology, they call this special revelation, OK? 
Okay, because that is God's divine word that he has given to us that was inspired by God. But he's also made himself known through creation. And that's called general revelation. How do we know this? We know this because the Apostle Paul talks about it in Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Several weeks ago, uh, when we did our class on naturalism, we looked at several examples that pointed to the existence of intelligence behind the universe. We saw that the universe consists of information, not just data. How many of you were here for that class? How many of you were here for naturalism? Okay. So there's a difference between data and information. And I even showed you a slide where, you know, those of you who have little kids, you, you have the little uh, alphabet magnets, right? And you walk into the room and you see a bunch of alphabet magnets randomly lying on the floor. That's data. But if you left the room and came back 10 minutes later, and if the same alphabet magnet said a statement, I love you, that's information. That's information that's been coherently put together by data. You're not going to walk into a room and see those alphabet magnets say, I love you, and say, oh, it probably fell off the fridge and just... No, you're not going to come to that conclusion. You're going to know, one of my little kids was here, and they did this. You immediately assume intelligence. When you see information, you assume intelligence. And what the scientific enterprise does is they examine the universe, physics, chemistry, biology, whatever it is, cosmology, everything, the universe is full of not just data, it's full of information. Right? So secular scientists have been telling us for decades now that the universe came about through pure chance. If that were true, we should expect to find on a biomolecular level only incoherent data. But that's not what we find. Right? Random chance cannot produce information. Only intelligence can do that. What's the second thing we noticed? We noticed that the universe was finely tuned. We call this the anthropic principle, right? And we went through several things. We talked about gravity. We talked about the electromagnetic force. We talked about the, the, the chemical bonding between the atoms. And we walked through several examples of where everything is so finely tuned that if any of those constants were off by even a decimal or two, life would be impossible. And we talked about the odds of something like that happening. How can random chance produce that level of precision? Several constants in the universe, gravity, chemical elements, electromagnetic force, all precisely tuned life could not be possible if any one of these were even tweaked a little bit, right? Randomness does not produce that kind of precision. Third point. In theology, they call this teleology. You see design in the universe. Anytime you see design, it implies purpose. There is a reason that tripod has three legs to it. If it had two legs to it, would it stand? It would not. The designers of the tripod knew that. There was an intelligent mind that went behind the design of that. The chair you're sitting on has that particular design because there was a purpose behind the design. Design implies purpose. Okay, So these are three very powerful uh, evidences for intelligence in the universe. You find not just data, you find information in the universe. You find that everything is very finely tuned. I, I actually, I'm trying to remember the name of the scientist, but um, I think it was, I don't know if it was, um, what's his name? Swinburne, Richard Swinburne, I think, was the one who said, you know, we look at the, we look at the natural universe and we think that it al it's almost as if it knew we were coming, is what he says. Okay? So it's almost as if the entire universe was particularly created and designed for us. That's not a coincidence. And the universe has teleology. It was designed with a purpose. Um, you 
know, when, when you look at when you look at design, you know there has to be a designer, right? This is not this is not rocket science. It's pretty usually if you see some sort of uh, some sort of work that's been done, there's usually somebody who's put into that work behind it. Um, sometimes uh, my wife will, uh, you know, she'll go somewhere and uh, I'll think to myself, okay, uh, let me get all the dishes done before she gets home so she doesn't walk into a, a dirty kitchen. Um, and so I'll, I'll do the dishes and I'll, you know, put everything away and she'll, she'll come back and sometimes she doesn't notice. Uh, sometimes she'll walk in and, you know, she won't say anything. She hasn't noticed that I've done the dishes. But you know when she notices? When she can't find a dish. <laughs> she opens the cabinets and it's not there. It's somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, okay, you did the dishes. And you put it all the way in the wrong place. <laughs> okay, so she sees the happy work that's been done and she knows that, she knows who the handyman was, right? And she says, I love you, thank you for doing the dishes, but that's not where that dish goes. Okay, no problem. I'll remember next time. I never remember next time. Um, so anyways, when you, when you look at design, you know there's a designer behind it. When you see handiwork, you know there's a handyman behind it. When you see information, you know there's intelligence behind it. Okay? So the scriptures identify the nature of a personal, intelligent God. We already know that. Romans 1.20, we just read that. But nature also reflects the work of a personal, intelligent God. Random chance cannot produce that level of precision or design or information. It cannot. So both of these, the scriptures and nature, reflect the work of a personal, intelligent being. What does that mean? The logical conclusion should be that science and Christianity are authored by the same God. Does that make sense? There is no contradiction. There is a certain level of order. There is a system. There is a design. There is a teleology in the universe. And scripture talks about such an order. It talks about such a design. And if, if it looks like the handiwork in nature and in scripture seem to be exactly the same, it's got all the, 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 the fingerprints of this person behind it, the logical conclusion is that it was the same person. I want to point out to you an interesting uh, observation, uh, because you know, one of the questions that probably comes up at this point as well, where did all this come from? When you think about the whole scientific enterprise, this goes all the way back. John was actually saying before the class that you know probably the first scientist was Adam. Uh, probably, depending on how you define the word scientist, right? I mean, I'm sure uh, Adam in the garden was examining things and he's looking at things and he was mystified by this amazing world that he's living in and he's he's trying to see how this all works. And so, yeah, I suppose uh, he was a scientist of sorts. But if, when you when you want to talk about you know the scientific movement in a formal sense, uh, it began around the early 16th century in Western Europe. Okay, that was kind of when there was sort of an explosion, if you will, of the formal scientific movement. And it happened in a predominantly Judeo-Christian culture. Um, Sean McDowell talks about this. Some of, the, some of the fathers of the scientific movement were incredible minds, like Galileo, Kepler, Pascal, Boyle, Newton, Faraday, Mendel, Pasteur were all theists, and most of them were Christians. Incredible innovations and advancements in the fields of physics and astronomy and mathematics and chemistry all took place during that Renaissance era leading up to the Enlightenment era, particularly in that part of the world. So is this any coincidence? I want to make sure that um, this doesn't come across as politically incorrect, but when you actually look at the history of a lot of other, uh, other cultures, if you will, you don't see this level of scientific explosion or advancement. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing politically incorrect about saying that. 
It's just a, it's a, just a historical fact. That is not to say that other races or other cultures have not produced anything good at all in the world. We're just saying that this explosion of knowledge and this explosion of innovation and creativity and modernization and scientific advancement found its origin and root in a primarily Judeo-Christian culture. I believe that the worldview of a lot of those other cultures dictated what they expected to see in the world and their assumptions that drove their research. So for example, you know, like you look through uh, the ancient Chinese culture. Any Chinese in here? Ancient Chinese culture. Um, China's produced some beautiful stuff. Nobody's denying that. But when you actually read through some of the history of their scientific enterprise and innovation, the government actually never gave that much importance for scientific research in those budding stages. Why? Because there was a kind of nihilistic kind of worldview. What's the big deal? So what if we don't know how that works? Yeah, okay, it's there. You know, there was, there was kind of this kind of like uh, blasé kind of attitude toward any sort of research endeavor. And I think their worldview had something to do with it. Uh, when, you, when you believe that there's nothing up there, there's no transcendent being, you don't expect to see transcendent handiwork in the world around you. But a lot of these men, a lot of these uh, scientific, uh, you know, the, sort of the, the, the fathers of the scientific movement, if you will, were all theists. They believed in a world full of order. They believed in the system. They believed uh, in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the lack of a randomness, and that came from their Judeo-Christian faith. They believed in a God. They believed that God was the creator of this universe, and if he was the creator of this universe, they could find his handiwork in creation. And that's what drove the scientific revolution, was because deep down inside, they knew their faith to be true. Does that make sense? So that's why you see this great disparity um, in the, the explosion or the initial movement uh, of the scientific enterprise. It was the Christian worldview that provided the intellectual foundation for modern science to flourish. For most of them, faith was a product of their scientific studies, and their motivation for further studies was their faith. Now, Einstein said this, this is a beautiful quote, I love this. He said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is so comprehensible. I love that quote. Einstein, one of the greatest minds, if not the greatest, is saying that. Right? He's, look, look at what he's saying. He's saying, look, I can't comprehend that. I look at this world around me. I look at the universe. I look at all these constants. I look at all these things that we have to spend hours and hours and hours to study. And when we finally get to the heart of it, there's so much order there. There's so much precision there. There's so much information there, and it's all comprehensible. I think that's a beautiful quote. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is so comprehensible. So, we talked about how everything requires a certain degree of faith, right? Let me make a, uh, an unconventional statement. Science operates on a very high level of faith. What do I mean by that? Science presupposes a lot of things. Here are the presuppositions of science. Science presupposes an objectively real world, right? When scientists go about, about to start their research, they're not saying, okay, uh, is this real or are we just in the matrix? Or is this just some sort of, it doesn't exist? No, nobody's saying that. They, they assume that it's real. They assume that it can be comprehensible. They assume that the world can be comprehensible. They assume that if they, if they snip a leaf and dice it up and put it under a microscope and magnify it, that they're going to see some things that's going to make sense to them. The third thing, they, they assume the reliability of reason, right? They know 
that if you if you drop you know acid into a you know onto a particular material based on what that material is the reaction is going to be different they know that so they trust their reason before they do it but also they 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 rely on their senses Nobody says, you know, okay, I'm going to go do an experiment. Let me go get my eyes checked first before I do this experiment. Because what if, I, what if I'm seeing something? How do I know that I can trust what I'm seeing? Nobody says that. Every scientist trusts his, he trusts his sight. He trusts his smell. He trusts his, you know, all of his senses. These are all presuppositions of science. These are all things that every scientist takes by faith when he walks into the lab. You guys see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. There is no, there is no objective, uh, you know, like uh, evidential test for every one of these things that he has to check off before he goes and does his research. These are all things scientists take by faith. All of these parameters are elements that even science assumes. This is why when scientists position science as a field of reason that is opposed to faith, they actually undercut their own case, don't they? Because science consistently assumes faith in multiple constants. And they get into even deeper trouble when they think that science can now substitute God as an explanation for everything in the natural world. This goes back to the point about being confused between agency and mechanism. They think that because they've figured out the particulars of the mechanism, the agency is not that important anymore. That is not true. I want to give you a very interesting thing. It's, uh, it's called the, the Miller-Urey experiment. I don't know how many of you have heard about this, but this was an experiment uh, back in uh, the 1950s in Chicago. Stanley Miller and Harold Urey actually were uh, two scientists that worked, on a, that worked on an experiment that attempted to replicate the atmospheric conditions of the early Earth. Like what they thought were the, the first primordial Earth. And they, they thought that if they could replicate the atmospheric conditions, that they could jumpstart life. That was their whole premise of this experiment. Okay, they, they did this back in the early 1950s. Um, and so their hypothesis was that if they could recreate the original atmospheric conditions, they, would, they could jump it. They can sort of jump it with the correct electrical stimulus, and it will produce the biochemical origin of life, that it will produce the amino acids that's necessary to create a protein, which is the basic building block of the DNA. So their experiment used water, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, along with heating and electrostimulation to produce the desired results. Now, here's the deal. By the end of the experiment, they were able to produce 11 types of amino acids. It's pretty good. That's good. This was seen as a major breakthrough in their time. You see how everything is mechanized? There's a very hard push for, me for understanding the mechanism of how something works. And they, they, they did all this research. They said, if we can figure out what the early atmospheric conditions were, we can figure out, we can jumpstart it with some electricity, we can see what it creates, we can, and then we can stand back and say, it's alive. Since then, however, other scientists have come to the conclusion that the experiment did not go far enough to explain every facet of life that we still do not have answers for. I think they're right, so let's, let me break this down for you. We'll break down the miller urey experiment. Here's the problem with it. Number one, it presupposes the existence of the Earth. Hold on. You're saying, if I can replicate the atmospheric conditions of the Earth, I can create life. No, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. Time up. Back up. You're already assuming the Earth exists. Who's going to give an explanation for that? You see what's going on, okay? They presuppose the existence of the Earth. Number two, raw materials, right? Uh, they stated that the necessity of gases, such as oxygen, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen, according to them, these were the raw materials necessary for the creation of life. But they never attempt to explain the raw materials. 
Where did those gases come from? You didn't create those gases. You're using those gases to try to create life, right? They don't, they don't uh, try to explain that. They just assume it. Here's another one. Amino acids are not sufficient to produce life. We know this now because the science actually proves that. Um, it, is, it, is the, it is true that it is the basic building block of life, but that doesn't explain how everything came together. This is like saying, oh, if I, if I can figure out a brick, I can figure out the city of Chicago. <laughs> Hold on, that's not even a brick. That's an element in the brick. That's all an amino acid is. Amino, you need amino acids for a protein, and a protein is the basic building block of the DNA. So what they're saying is, oh, we figured out one of the elements that make up a brick. Therefore, we can explain the city of Chicago. No, you can't. You're sort of missing a few steps along the way. Okay? So that was the third one. But the fourth one, this is the most startling of all. It required intelligence to put the whole experiment together. The whole premise of naturalism is to say that the way everything came together came by chance. Did this experiment happen by chance? No, there were two scientists who put their minds together. They came up with a hypothesis. They had a lab. They got all the raw materials. They put everything together. They facilitated it. They coordinated it. They, they pushed the button to jumpstart it. And they stood back and they watched everything happen. How can you do all that and then say, yeah, that's how it happened. All this happened in the early primordial Earth by chance. It didn't happen by chance in your lab. Why would it happen by chance back then? Okay? These are all pretty straightforward problems with the Ura, uh, miller Urey experiment, right? There's a, I just thought of this joke now, but uh, the joke, it goes that a couple of scientists want to, uh, they, they tell God, we can make life, we know how to do it. Uh, first, you take some dirt, and then God says, time out, go get your own dirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, right? You have to assume some things before you start. I, I like that cartoon. Here's a scientist looking at all that stuff, and he says, if I can just synthesize life here, then I'll have proven that no intelligence was necessary to form life in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, not a very flattering statement about himself, right? But I think this is sadly a caricature of the scientific enterprise. They saw off the branch on which they're sitting by thinking that. They think that if they explain the mechanism, if they explain how the processes work, if they explain the, the, the how, then nothing else matters. In other words, there are several para parameters that are even beyond the reach of science that is best explained, I think, by Christian theism. There's an illustration that's... Uh, Professor John Lennox. How many of you have heard of Professor John Lennox? He's a professor uh, of mathematics at the University of uh, Oxford. Very, very intelligent man, wonderful man. Um, uh, I, I actually had the chance to, uh, to briefly say hello to him uh, in Atlanta. And uh, very, very intelligent man. He's one of the premier ma mathematical minds in the world today. And he's a Christian. And he gives this example, you know, he, he talks about his aunt Matilda making an amazing cake. And he says, let's use this illustration, all right? He says, let's say my aunt Matilda makes this beautiful cake and a bunch of scientists come around it to try to analyze the cake and study the cake, okay? The nutrition scientists are going to calculate the calories and they'll determine the effect it will have on your body. Okay, that's important. Good. The biochemist will inform us about the structure of the fats and the proteins in the cake. Okay, that's good. Frankly, I don't care about the fats as long as it tastes good, right? Um, the chemists will describe the elements and their bonding process, how all of those elements uh, within the cake bond. The physicists will be able to analyze the cake in terms of its, you know, basic fundamental principles, I guess. Particles. 
And I bet, I guarantee you, if there were mathematicians there, they would be able to give a very eloquent mathematical equation for how all these things fit together. But now that these experts have given their analysis, can we honestly say that this cake has been thoroughly explained? No. Why? Dr. Lennox says that all these intelligent men gave us a very forensic explanation of the elements that make up the cake and how they all work. But what if they were asked why the cake was made in the first place? Nobody has an answer for that. What if they were asked who it was made for? They can't answer that. But the most important question of all, who made the cake? They can't answer that either, right? When you walk into a room and you see a beautiful masterpiece sitting like that, the first question you're going to ask yourself is not, I wonder how many proteins there are in that cake. <laughs> or I wonder what the, you know, what the particle bonding uh, 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 you know, stimuli is in that cake. Nobody asks questions like that. I'm hungry. <laughs> that looks delicious. I'd like a piece. Yeah, I want to Who made it? Cake. Who is it for? <laughs> That's all that matters, right? <laughs> See, those questions are the more fundamental questions that people ask. Those are the questions that are outside of the jurisdiction of science. All the scientific experts in the world cannot answer those questions. Except for one person. Who's that one person? Aunt Matilda herself. Right? If you want to answer those questions, you go straight to Aunt Matilda and you say, Hey, did you make this cake? It's beautiful. Who is the cake for? Can I have a piece, please? Mm -hmm. Right? She's the only one who's able to answer those questions. The greatest minds in the universe cannot answer those questions. Does that make sense? Only she can reveal that she made it, who she made it for, and why she made it. These are the questions that we ask ourselves of the world and the universe we live in every day. But there are other elements of the cake that are still beyond the purview of science. Admiring the beauty or the elegance of the cake, science cannot explain aesthetics. Right? Aesthetics is not some science doesn't have a category for aesthetics. All it can say is explain it can only explain the, the forensic details of the cake. It, science is in no position to talk about, to make an aesthetic judgment of the cake. Or why the taste of that first bite tastes so sublime and may remind you of something your mom made when you were a kid. Science can't explain that. Because there's something beautiful happening inside of you. When you take that bite, science may explain how your taste buds are soaking in that flavor cannot explain why that evokes childhood memories and brings a warm feeling in your heart and makes you want to have another bite because it reminds you of mom. Science cannot explain that. Does that make sense? These are the experiences that humans value above everything else. Nobel laureate Peter Medawar says that the existence of a limit to science is made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions. Questions like how did everything begin or why are we all here? He's absolutely right. Let me, let me repeat that again. He says the existence of a limit to science is made clear by its inability to answer childlike elementary questions. Nobody is asking rocket science kind of questions about the world. But we are asking questions like, what is my purpose in life? How can I have meaning in life? What am I here for? What is my destiny? Science is unable to answer those kinds of questions. Science is also curiously silent on matters of aesthetics, beauty, meaning, purpose, or Morality. Even in a crime, science can, uh, science can explain that a person died by poisoning. Science cannot explain why 
a person on this present. You see what I'm saying? If we want answers to those kinds of questions, we always turn to history, literature, music, philosophy, and theology. All of those disciplines fall outside of the purview of science's ability to answer questions. Ladies and gentlemen, long before any scientific journal was written, Genesis began with the words, in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. The universe, the earth, the human body are all filled with not just data, but information that could have only come from an intelligent mind. King David eloquently describes this in Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 to 4. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. And then look at this poetic twist here. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, the words to the ends of the world. Nature speaks volumes about the creator God who made all things. Um, our Christian faith does not have to be at war with science. On the contrary, what drove the early great scientific thinkers was precisely the idea that science was a beautiful agency that helped them see the forensics of their faith in the universe around them. What we do have to be careful about is to not fall prey to the idea of scientism. See, there's a difference between, see, because notice that when we did worldviews, all of those worldviews ended with an ism, right? Naturalism, pantheism. Well, there's actually something called scientism. Scientism is the worldview that science alone can explain everything. That's a worldview. So Christ Christians, we as Christians sitting here in this room, do not have to be wary of science. We don't have to be. We don't have to be afraid of science. We don't have to be like, oh man, science. Uh, anytime something science comes up, you know, I, I'm just kind of going to be on my guard. No, we don't have to be, because science shows that the author of it is the same author who gave us the book we read every day. What we do have to be careful about is a worldview called scientism. That, I think, is a fallacy. Scientism is a wrong view that says everything in this world can and should be explained by science and science alone. Right? And that is simply not true. God wired human beings with the curiosity and the creativity to engage, experience, and study the world around them so that they might see the heart and the mind of God in and through the world that he created for them. And that when we find ourselves loving the artwork in our lives, that we would ultimately turn and give glory to the divine artist who was behind it the whole time. Uh, when I was in, I just want to finish with this, when, when I was in Scotland, um, uh, Aberdeen, Scotland, you know, it's, it's almost rainy and drizzly there, almost 300 days in a year. And I was, I was walking uh, down the street once to, to go hop on a bus, and I saw this beautiful cathedral across the street. And I thought to myself, I've always wanted to walk into a cathedral. I just want to see what it's like. And... I, I, I walked in, I, was, I, I crossed the road, and I, was, I passed this one gentleman who was, he looked very scholarly, you know, he was just sitting there on the bench and he was reading this journal, and it said this scientific something. And, you know, and, and he was, he just looked like he was seriously reading it, and I thought, okay, well, great. And I walked into the cathedral, and as soon as I walked in, it just took my breath away. Because that ceiling was like, I felt like it was a hundred feet tall. And I felt this small when I was standing in there. Like every step echoed through the cathedral. Those stained glass windows were just breathtaking. I felt this small. 
And I thought of that man sitting up there, and I thought, you know, science could probably explain the architecture and how all of this was built. Science has no category to explain why I feel the way I feel when I walk into this place. But you know what? I think the architects who built that knew that. I think it was intentionally built that way so you feel small versus the transcendent magnitude of God. You see that? That's why a lot of those early cathedrals, a lot of those early church buildings and all that were constructed in that way. There is something breathtaking about experiencing that. This is another reason why those of you who go, who's been to the Grand Canyon, how many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? It's breathtaking, isn't it? You go there, and you just step out, and you look at nature around you, and you're like, I don't even know how to explain this. All I know is, wow. That's all I know. C.S. Lewis said uh, that he struggled for years to try to, to, try to really uh, find some sort of parallel for the word glory. Right? Because glory is always associated with God. And he was like, how, how am I... What is there that I can that comes even closest to understanding the word glory? And one day he figured it out. He said, I know what it is. It's nature. When you go stand before the magnificent Victoria Falls, or the Grand Canyon, or the pyramids, or you know, some amazing uh, you know, wonder of the world, that is precisely what you feel. You feel that sense of being really small. You feel that sense of glory. You feel that sense of awe. Around you, and yes, there's some. There's always some science that can explain that. But your heart, the human heart, doesn't pang for the mechanism; it pangs for the agent behind it. The human heart was designed to worship. When you stand there and gaze out into the Grand Canyon, and it takes away your breath, and it gives you sends chills down your spine, and you're like, I could stand here forever. That is almost a sort of worship. You're seeing the handiwork of the Creator. And you're awed by the handiwork of the Creator. You're not awed by the mechanism of how it probably took thousands of years for the wind and the rain and the, the tide to create all those things. All that is fascinating. It's great. But just the very, the very beauty of it moves you to worship the agent, not the mechanism. Okay? So... Let's go ahead and close, and then uh, I'll give you guys some time for questions. <clears throat> Father, we just come before you today, Lord. We just want to thank you for just giving us this opportunity to just meditate on the way you've spoken to us, God. You've spoken to us in your holy word. You've spoken to us in your inspired scripture. You have revealed yourself uh, in your scriptures, Lord and through the life of Jesus. And Father, yet, you have, you're have you speaking to us every day in another sense. When we walk out and we see the trees and we look up at the sky and we see the stars, uh, Lord, all of these, the heavens declare the glory of your hand. And Father, we pray, Lord, that we as believers, we as Christians, will every day stand with that conviction and speak with that conviction that all truth is God's truth. We don't have to separate truth down the middle. We don't have to separate truth and say, well, this part of it is scientific truth, and this part of it is some sort of faith truth. We don't have to split and, you know, uh, and, and try to put everything in a box. We, we know, we understand. In fact, the very, the very intelligence and the creativity and the curiosity and the inquisitiveness that you've given human beings to do the research to figure out the kinds of technological advances that we have made today, you gave us that knowledge, God. And now it is, it is unfortunate that human beings have taken the knowledge that you have given them to argue you out of existence. And we pray, Lord, that you will forgive us for that sort of uh, blindsidedness if any of us have that. We pray, Lord, that we will be uh, the light to the world and salt to the earth even as we go out and enjoy your nature, even as we go out and uh, see the simple, a simple thing 
like boiling water in a kettle. Science has so many ways to explain that in terms of the, the boiling temperature of water and all those things, but how beautiful are the ways in which we can use that water to nourish ourselves or for any other reason, God. We thank you, God, and we, we pray that you will resonate this truth within our hearts every day, that all truth is God's truth. And for that, you are worthy of our worship and worthy of praise. We thank you, God, and we ask you all this in your wonderful and precious name. Amen. Amen.